Yes. All right, try again in the back now. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. I'll go ahead and get started. I, I think I'm the uh, the last one in between uh, everyone and lunch, so we'll get uh, get right to it. They always say as a speaker guy, it's either before lunch or maybe the last one of the day before before the bar might open are the uh, challenging ones. But uh, Mark Valinsky with Kaspersky Labs, really happy to be here. I think this is the fourth or fifth year Kaspersky's had involvement in the conference as at least a sponsor, and the third or fourth time we've had uh, someone from Kaspersky uh, speaking. So honored to be here. I think we had one of our senior virus analysts was one of the uh, keynotes last year. We just had a gentleman do a session before him, but I'm part of the corporate marketing team and go around to a lot, a lot of speaking and uh, at events. So let me press my timer here so I keep to my promise of not cutting into, uh, cutting into lunch. But the talk really, as you might guess, two big pieces, the explosion of cybercrime, and there I'll take you through initially, as we kind of like to say, as we see it from our side of the fence as a security, uh, security vendor, what we see the bad guys up to with some uh, opening some general stuff about the overall Threatscape, the growth of malware, uh, share with you an annual uh, secure, global security study we do, and then from there I'll transition into a section on uh, phishing and uh, talk a little about uh, that. From a, uh, Again, go over a study we did a year or so back, give you some examples, some things to think about there. Then I'll move into a few slides on mobile security. On one hand, you know, the numbers are still small. With mobile security, I'm talking specifically about, you know, viruses and malware trying to get onto our Android phones and our Windows tablets. And as you see on one hand, the numbers are small, but they really are growing. I think it's something people need to be more and more aware of and be, be thinking about. And then I'll start to transition into the second half of the talk, the five ways IT may be an accomplice. And there, I like to say there's no right or wrong answers. I hope what you'll find is just a few quick philosophical things to think about what, and I'll lump myself in with all of you, is what we as IT folks could be doing or not doing in just the day-to-day -day routine and the day-to-day -day rat race. So without thinking about it, we're making ourselves more vulnerable or more vulnerable to attack from the bad guys. And then there'll be just one of the two quick slides about us at the end. So I'd like to start off all of my various talks with this slide that I came across of all the good on the internet. And that might be small, and I think the slides are on the app, but if you want a copy of the deck, I'd be happy to <laughs> email it to you. But uh, some, some crazy stuff. 350 gig of data uploaded onto Facebook every 60 seconds. 570 new websites. This one, uh, yeah, my, little, my little pointer thing is not working. 104,000 Snapchats per second. I have a, two girls that are 16 and 13. I, th I think they take up a big percentage of uh, <laughs> big percentage of that number. But with all that good, obviously comes all all of the bad. So this was our fourth year. We started doing a truly a global survey of IT security folks, trying to get ask them lots of questions. You know, what's keeping them up at night, things like that. And to give you a perspective. This uh, year it was. Uh, about 3,900 respondents from about 30 countries around the world of environments of all shapes and sizes and different different verticals. Uh, and of note, wow, this is really unfortunate that my little thing is not working. Um, we had a switch in the leaderboard from 2013 to 2014, and spam moved from number two to number one is kind of the biggest concern of what are you uh, what are you worried about? And I thought to myself, well, I guess you know a lot of the I was a little surprised when I saw that, but I thought, well, you know, there's so much spam out there, and that's all carrying the virus and, and malware, so maybe not surprising that from a perception perspective that could, uh, that could have moved up like it did. And then of note, uh, two questions we ask every year is, have you, do you feel you've suffered a cyber attack in the last 12 months? And it was 94% yet said yes, and that was up 3% year over year from the previous year. And then the other thing we ask is uh, one of the many is uh, have you been the victim of a targeted attack? And the number is much smaller, but again, it was 12% said yes, and that was up 3% year over year as well. Now, it's always, as I said, I'm already in a tough spot because I'm the last guy before lunch. It is very risky when you're a speaker guy to ask an audience participation question, so I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be bold here, all right? So one of the questions that was asked in the survey with these categories, these number bands, is how many malware samples do you think are discovered, new, 
new samples on a daily basis. So this is where you would like yell out numbers, where, where I'm looking for some help here. All right, all right. Who said, who said 10,000? It was sort of back, all right. So as a reward for, uh, for you being the first, you can have a cup of coffee on the way home. Okay. So it seemed like there were mostly low numbers, I heard, 10,000. And by the way, he was, well, I don't want to give anything away. So that was, uh, that was where the respondents came in. So before I bring up the winning answer, maybe another audience participation? <laughs> okay. So we're going to go with the first one? Okay. Well, even though it's not the correct answer, you can have a cup of coffee as well. <laughs> 250 to 350,000 new samples of malware a day. Yes. So that could be like something net new, or it could be you know, sort of a new variation of something that there was already a signature for. So don't feel bad, sorry. I mean, I think about 91% of the people surveyed had it under, under 250,000. And then I'm going to move pretty quickly here, but then just breaking that survey down a little, you can see spam up year over year, the virus malware down a little bit, phishing up. You know, most everything sort of up and to the right in the way of those specific categories. And then we said, what do you think? This was kind of interesting because the majority of the folks still said that malware was their perceived most serious threat, even though they said spam was kind of a bigger, bigger concern. So you wonder how many, when you think about and see that 90% of the people thought it was 250,000 or below, that there still is, people think it's bad out there, but don't necessarily stop and realize how bad it is. And I'm not trying to scare anyone here. This is not meant to be fear-mongering. And quickly now, just the evolution and growth of malware over the years as we've seen it, and I don't know that our numbers are any different from any of the other AV vendors. So back in the mid-90s, pretty slow, global numbers. You know, so just the hackers, you know, doing it to kind of brag to their friends. 2006, starting to get a little faster. That's probably about the time when the common folks started to become aware of viruses and that they needed this stuff called antivirus a little bit. And then 2011, we're starting to get really, really fast. And then to the point where we are today, where we're, you know, we're seeing 325,000 new threats a day, new samples coming into our lab. And to give you another number, uh, kind of a couple of data points to sort of benchmark, I don't know, benchmark is the right word, but I started with a company in late 2007 and early into 2008, I always remember there was an internal email came out from one of the product guys saying, hey people, big historic day today, we just wrote the one millionth signature in the history of our database, which for sake of discussion, 2007, it was 10, 11 years old maybe. The early part of 2013, you know, a mere five years after that, we went over 100 million signatures. So you think it were like 11 years to get to one, then five years we added 100. So it truly has been explosive and it continues. I saw this article back in January on CNET. Basically, more malicious software has been created the past two years and the previous 10 years combined. And this, I think, will be my last numbers. Like I said, if anybody wants these, I think they're on the app or I can send it to you. But this is sort of a year in review for us of uh, attacks against the protected Kaspersky user base worldwide, et cetera, and other things we saw. So over that top line, over 6 billion attacks uh, detected and neutralized. Uh, then this one was kind of interesting down here. Almost 2 million attempts to launch banking malware on computers were, uh, were neutralized. And I want to make a couple brief comments on this slide about, I like to call this slide just sort of talking about the playing field of us, us versus the bad guy. Maybe it's the pacifist to me that doesn't like to say the battlefield. But every year I use, I've used this slide for several years in my talks. I'll look in January and try to find some websites to give me an idea of, how, a rough idea of how many websites there are on the internet at the end of the previous year or so. One site I looked at in January said it's kind of, hard depending on how you categorize a website, but their best estimation was 1.2 billion sites online at the end of last year. And when I started using this slide, you know, let's say four years ago, that number was like five to five to 600 million. The one thing I read last year from our, our uh, senior virus analysts, they were tracking, and they said that 
on the average, one in every 14 downloads from the World Wide Web is compromised. So 1.2 billion sites out there, lots of opportunity there for the bad guys, for us to worry about. And then I check, uh, try to check and see, uh, get an estimate on how many active email accounts there are in the world. And I read a study a couple of years ago, their projection was by the end of 2014, it was like some numbers, like, it was like around 4 billion, give or take a couple hundred thousand, was their best estimation of active email accounts. And numbers I've read over the years would say 7 out of 10 or 8 out of 10 emails just in general created are spam. So you start saying, you know, 8 times 4 billion, you quickly get to some staggering, staggering numbers of uh, spam that's out there. We'll talk about that a little more. And then the whole social networking, you know, I've got my kids doing the Snapchat thing, which they try to explain to me, and I still can't figure out how that's different than the texting. But I want to tell you a quick uh, Facebook story. And uh, since I've never really met any of you, I'd like you to take me at face value that I consider myself a reasonably intelligent person as I tell you this quick story. And the key word there is reasonably. Uh, this was a few years ago, and I'm, I'm a big Facebook, you know, guy. <clears throat> and I was in my home office, it was like a Monday night, about 10 o'clock. I'm uh, on my laptop, so I'm connected to our VPN. I think I was just doing some email, and I saw I had Facebook on one of the browsers. It was kind of flashing that there was a Facebook message, so I looked at it, and it was from this guy, Justin, who works at Kaspersky, but not somebody in my immediate you know, inner circle of day-to-day -day people. So I thought it was a little strange, but 10 o'clock on a Monday night, I get this random message, hey, Mark, how are you? Well, that's kind of strange. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don't give it away. <laughs> so I said, uh, Oh, good, Justin. Busy, you know, just moved into the new role in marketing. How are you? And Justin replies back, well, I'm in deep you-know-what over here. And I censored his language here for the audience. And I thought, hmm, because the guy's a vice president of the company. I don't want to demean myself, but he doesn't want to tell little old me if he's really in deep you-know-what. And my wife happened to be walking through my office at that point. I said, well, this is really strange. I wonder if this guy's got his marks confused because he doesn't want to be telling me that. So anyway, so I said, oh, that's, that's too bad. And reply back, hey, I really need some help. I'm in London. It's, it, working with me on the reasonably intelligent, he did and still does a lot of international travel, so it was not out of the question that he was in London. What do you need? Request comes back. Can you wire me for some, some money for the hotel? And at that point, I legitimately had a mini freak out. Uh, <laughs> I logged out of Facebook. You know, I sent the real Justin an email. said, dude, you had a real problem in your Facebook account right now. And I remember saying to my wife, I was like, Oh my God, you know, we've got slides in our presentations about this very sort of thing, and it just happened to me. You know, on one hand, there was, the, there was certainly not a chance I was going to send the money, but what was troubling but a very good learning experience for that night is, you know, you can't, you can't trust anything out there. And now I want to transition into the fishing, and this is not coming across that well, but a quote from a gentleman from the Sands Institute, he's basically a paraphrasing there, saying that, you know, in his feeling that, you know, IT guys kind of get the phishing problem, but they're kind of lacking the time and resources to try to get the messaging across to their user communities of what to do or not do to try to try to stay ahead of it. Because, you know, I think a while back, you know, the bad guys were sitting around. Somebody had an idea, said, hey, if we can't, you know, steal their passwords or guess them, you know, maybe we can trick them into giving them to us. We'll send them these emails from maybe companies or organizations they work with. We'll get them to go to a bogus website and give us the information. And some of these look, eh. Some can look really bad. <laughs> some look, you know, if you were a Lloyd's or London customer, that looks pretty legitimate. And I got this one a couple of months ago, and I thought it was kind of uh, amusing because it was from American Airlines. I thought, well, geez, the bad guys didn't research me. This wasn't a targeted attack because they obviously don't know that I have diamond level status with Delta and I only fly American in emergency situations. And then upon closer review of the email, it says it's from American Airlines, but the actual email address is verification at the bestdentalchair.com. So I, I didn't realize American had outsourced some of their ticket management systems to a dental chair company. Now some more numbers. We launched this survey. We uh, put this survey out towards the end of 2013. It was one of the things that really caught my attention to how bad phishing uh, really was. So basically, in a year over the same year over year time frame, we looked at we saw almost a 90% growth in the amount of phishing, phishing emails and attacks we saw towards our base. And then we took all that data and cut it up a little bit and said, all right, what are the 
bigger picture website categories or alleged websites that um, these emails are trying to send people to. And if we go counterclockwise, payment services, e-shops, you know, banking, social networks, you know, email sites, search engines, certainly a very evident theme there of personal information, banking information, credit card information. So, you know, lots of opportunity for them. Lots of risk and things for us to think about from a personal level as well as trying to protect your user communities. And then we peeled it back even farther and said, all right, irregardless of categories, what are the top 10 you know, most targeted sites or brand names, if you will? And when I looked at that list for the first time, I thought, there's three, four, five of those that I visit on a pretty regular basis from either um, any of my you know, work devices or personal devices at home. And I'm mean, going to guess most of you might be in that three, four, five category, and we can make the assumption for sake of this discussion that uh, probably the vast majority of the employees in your various organizations are in there as well. So before I go to the next slide, I'll try to remember the top four, Yahoo, Facebook, Google, and Amazon. So we then look at this study that we came across of basically, what are employees wasting their time on during the day while they're on the clock? Those folks that said they were on the computer during the day, look, Yahoo, Facebook, Google, and Amazon, so four out of the top five. So it goes to show the bad guys are doing their, doing their research here. And then now the opposite end of, uh, you know, that American Airlines, you know, the broad brush email, you know, two, 300,000 people could have uh, gotten that email at uh, the same I did. Then over obviously the past few years, we moved to the spear phishing and these targeted attacks where the bad guys are now saying, we want to get into this particular entity because we think we can steal a lot of money from them or intellectual property or we want to, you know, just smear their reputation. And they're going to spend lots and lots of time trying to figure out how to get in there. And the one I know for me, and I've had a lot of you in the room that kind of put this whole targeted attack thing on the map was the RSA one a few years ago. Because on one hand, I thought, wow, they're like the largest security company in the world. And if they could get breached, wow. Um, but the interest, couple of interesting things that I think some people still don't know when you talk to the targeted nature and the, how far these guys will go, some people don't realize that RSA was not the original victim here. Bad guys were working trying to get into Lockheed Martin, and the word was to steal plans for one of the new fighter jets. Unsuccessful, they learned that Lockheed was using the RSA tokens. So they said, hey, maybe we'll go do a whole separate target attack to RSA, see if we can get in, steal the algorithms, so we get back to Lockheed. Ended up being successful on both fronts. And if you look at it, as big a company as RSA with however many people, the whole thing was two employees in their HR department got an email that went into their spam folder. One of them looked, probably going 100 miles an hour like we all do during the day. Said, hmm. Clicks on it. Oh, file's empty. Damage already been done. What I learned last year, still this far after the breach, the email is obviously spoofed, but it says it's from webmaster at beyond.com. So speaking of the kind of the social engineering of what these guys will do, at that particular time, RSA was working with an outside HR headhunter recruiting company called Beyond. So you can sort of illustrates how far they will go in that social engineering. And you can, it's more understandable how somebody in HR going pretty quick might doing a quick scan of their spam folder might click on something. And then, I mean, all these attacks look the same. Now, once somebody clicks on that email, the exploits put on the network. They're in there for long periods of time, getting what they need before they're up and out of there. And another example I want to share with you, I was lucky enough last summer to see a talk at an ISS, ISSA event over on the East Coast, and it was uh, the CISO from a large uh, university, and he gave me permission to use these slides. He just asked that I make them, you know, ABC University. But he was there to talk to folks, did a very in-depth presentation about a successful phishing attack that had happened to them at the university. And he wanted to sort of get the word out and sort of uh, help with that. And then I recently saw a warning note about the various, uh, the, this, uh, the same thing. And basically, a whole bunch of people, I think it was about 250 people around the university, and he was very clear to say, these are very smart, tenured people. He's kind of funny, he goes, you know, like doctor in front of their name. They got an email, it was probably on the weekend, very cleverly designed, I'll show it to you in a second, with an end game of getting login information to their kind of personal account on the university uh, system that had you know, lots of you know, kind of their employee account. So this is pretty much what the email looked like. You know, their employee 
we're showing that uh, you know the we're showing that uh, detect that your ABC University account was accessed from a blacklisted IP in Arizona. If this was not you, you could be infected. So please click here and and do these couple things. So that's the real site, and that's the fake site. Real, fake. So this one did not have, you know, was, did not have a little S on the end, and then the URL was actually different. And the way they found out that there had been a problem is that I believe 30 or so people followed the instructions, logged in, and one of them, a couple weeks after, was looking at his bank account because his paycheck was direct deposited, like not there. So they started doing some research, and for 11 of the 30 people or so that logged in, bad guys had gone in and just changed the bank routing code for their for their paychecks. So then he went on to say, because kind of in the end of me, he was kind of humble and funny. He said, "So shame on me." He said, uh, "As soon as we got our arms around what had happened, I was a proponent that we had to go public with it, let the user community know, and kind of get them on guard." So they put an art, they put a little article in the uh, like the online school newspaper. And a couple of days after that, this email shows up to like 500 people at the university. It's basically saying, "Hey, as you heard from the security team, we were the victim of a successful phishing attack. We decided to do an emergency upgrade of the." Uh, the portal, click here to validate your new, <laughs> your new credentials. And he said he went into a very long technical discussion about what they were doing um, on the sites, but he said, you know, they did make good on the paychecks before they were able to get some, somebody in the back. He was very clear to say, you know, we didn't have to do that. And he said, imagine if this had been 50, 75, 100 people, we would have been talking about, you know, really a lot of money. And you went on to you know some of the basics that they were working with people on of uh, suspicious emails, clicking on links, things of uh, things of that nature. And then quickly, how many of you saw our senior team just announced we found this Carbonac uh, was a organization over in the the far over in the uh, way in the Russia Ukraine area that um, over time our estimate has stolen up to a billion dollars from banks around the world. And it all started with us finding it. I think it was a bank, I think it was in the Ukraine. They had a bunch of money come spitting out of an ATM one day while there was nobody around. And that was a warning sign to them that something might be strange going on. So they, so they, they called Kaspersky and asked them to start doing some forensics. And what we found was this large thing that had been going on for a few years, all starting with a phishing email with an exploit into these bank's employees. And then once they found the admin computer, they were able to get screen views of all the employees, what they were doing. And then some of the money was just transferred you know, from one account to another. In some cases, they inflated a bank account. So somebody had $1,000 in it. They stuck an extra zero in it, moved $9,000 to another account. Then it's back to 1000 So the person you know, with the bank account didn't even see anything. It's, oh, it's $1,000. My balance is the same. And the last thing was controlling the ATMs, which sort of, sort of gave this away, where they would send what they would call a money mule or someone to the ATM that they had control of at the set time, and then would just push the money out, uh, out to them. Uh, and that's sort of a breakdown of where we saw that stuff around the world. And the, the guys were saying, you know, it's really probably one of the more sophisticated APTs that they'd ever ever seen. Now let's check my time. Uh, mobile, mobile, mobile malware, security risks. You know, I travel all the time. I would call it to be your typical corporate road warrior guy. Portland, Oregon last week here. I'm flying down to North Carolina tonight. And a couple of years ago, I was putting together for the first time a new presentation on mobile security. It was towards the end of the of a month that I was doing it. I thought, geez, I wonder how many different wireless networks I've connected to this month in my in my travels. I kind of went back through my Outlook calendar, and uh, and I was around 35, you know, plus or minus one or two, and that was pretty eye-opening for me to, uh, you know, to the risks, the risks that are that are out there. But for someone from me that you know lives on the road, it's inevitable. And then it was a couple of years ago I was able to get um, my corporate email put onto my personal iPad, and a few days after that I just kind of thought this little revelation. I said, wow. Here's little me again. I've got 
copy my, copy my email on three devices, you know, my iPad, my phone, and my laptop. So there's me with three times as much data outside of our firewall than inside. Just kind of made me stop and pause and said, geez, I wonder if this is one of the reasons the help desk guys were always so grumpy when I call. You know, what do you want now? Came across this last year. Did anybody know that mobile malware celebrated its 10th birthday last year? I, I didn't know either until I saw this article. It was kind of interesting because they were quoting or referencing a uh, mobile AV researcher from Fortinet who 10 years ago was writing about the first piece of mobile malware discovered that was uh, a worm targeting a specific Nokia phone that if it got on the phone, the only way it could spread was over Bluetooth. <laughs> and then the same guy 10 years later is writing about ransomware on the Android platform. I thought that was a pretty dramatic bookend of the complexity and the growth that has been seen. So I'm going to go through just to here. So these are, I'm sorry that that is, is not showing that well. So this is slide reflects, well actually let me go back. So this slide reflects specific mobile malware signatures in our database. So I told you five years ago we went over 100 million and we're way, way north of that. So at the end of Q4, um, I'm sorry, the end of Q1 of last year, 300,000. So in one hand, an insignificant amount. But we wrote, so that's roughly 110,000 new, new signatures in just in Q1. We had written for all of 2013 like 140,000. So as you can see, last year got off to quite, quite a start. And then it finished where we basically saw 300,000 new mobile programs were detected. And that was almost three times as many as we'd seen in 2013. So again, on one hand, small, but on the other hand, really exploding up into the right very, uh, very quickly. And our mobile products, whether it be for, you know, consumer or businesses that might be using, detected and blocked uh, 1.4 million attacks on Android devices around, around the world last year. And the last thing of note on the mobile front was the shocking growth in mobile banking Trojans. So at the end of 2013, we had, I don't know, maybe about 15, you know, 1,500. And, you know, we finished last year at, you know, north of 12,000. So a tremendous increase there. And there we're talking about malware specifically designed to get onto your phones, tablets with an end game of your banking credentials. And then a breakdown of uh, mobile malware as it came to the lab. So it looks, because these things really are mini computers, it looks looks a lot like you know window, Windows based stuff aside from the Trojan SMS and that's the premium texting malware that's mostly over in Europe where it gets on your phone you don't know it's there and you're sending premium text messages to a service that the hackers have a financial interest into you get your phone bill the next month it's like the heck happened here uh, Android far and away the most uh, exploited uh, system probably not telling you anything you don't know there and then just quickly, a couple things that I've picked up over the time that have kind of caught my attention on the mobile front. Because so like I said, I travel all the time. And I saw this, I was in a layover somewhere, and a buddy of mine had this posted on his Facebook page. So it kind of caught my attention. But this was a security researcher, you know, maybe at a conference like this over in Europe, who was claiming to have an Android app that he'd written in about 45 minutes that he said could have some, let's just say, cause and effect on a couple of systems within an airplane that would maybe cause it to change direction. Just kind of read that, said a little prayer, and walked on to the flight. And then this was out at Black Hat last year. A guy was talk, doing a talk about uh, the potential risks of with the wireless on the planes now, the entertainment systems, and what a hacker could do just on a, on a flight. And then a couple other things here I just want to move through. These were examples of, with the Verizon thing, this was a security researcher who found a, a flaw just in his online account where he would log in to check his phone bill. The last 10 digits of the URL were his phone number. I guess on a whim, he thought, geez, I wonder what happens if I put in, put in a new phone number. So able to get right in. Luckily, he was a Verizon customer, so he let him know. And the Apple thing was a couple of guys uh, reverse engineered the encryption that they use on the, the iMessaging servers. And I forget if it was, it was either something they did or didn't do that potentially made that victim for a, uh, made it, made it possible that you could be victim of a man in the middle attack. You could have a secure phone and be iMessaging to somebody else with a secure phone and the stuff gets intercepted. And then this last one on the mobile front, this was down in uh, Brazil, one of our senior analysts is based down there. And he wrote an article uh, before the World Cup, 
down there of some tips for people coming down to try to stay safe. And this one just really threw me. You know, you can now plug in to get power in the airport and you can get more than just uh, power on your device. Oh, actually, actually, my last, my last mobile slide here. So I think one of the big things with the Android is the bad, you know, the bad malicious apps, whether it be apps that are up at, you know, legitimate sites to be downloaded or, or unsafe, illegitimate sites. So we looked through last year and publicly put our name to this, and we've logged 10 million du dubious Android applications to date. And I've got a whole thing on mobile where one of the slides is uh, a screenshot of a good app next to a bad app. And it was like for a little app to help you play guitar. And you could quickly see looking at that, that you could go up, you know, looking for a specific app and click on the, the dubious one right next to it that's been designed to look almost like it. Or you could just go say, hey, I need some sort of an app for guitar. Quickly download the bad one and you get that standard message the app would like to access all the stuff on your phone. You don't know any better and you say yes and then it's a bad app and then you're really really in trouble. Now the drop zone, this is real, it's advertised. So uh, a couple, couple of years back, one of our guys accessed a server being used by a cybercrime outfit. So you logged in and you look around over here, you can see you know, the number of, uh, number of botnets that they have available. They can drill down a little and get the number of botnets by uh, operating systems, see what they have in inventory for their various operations. And then moving around, the guy was able to get some, see some, get some screen grabs of actual infected computers that are part of the botnet. And they obviously hit a gold mine with this, with you know names or stuff, IP addresses. Then here's another, although in a different language. If you were to look closely, especially in the front row, you can see a couple of the words, and you can kind of guess the site that this computer was visiting and possibly where it became infected with the malware. In vulnerabilities, this would be the proverbial, if you only remember one thing the Kaspersky guy said at Columbus this year. Again, probably the basics that everybody knows already. Unpatch third-party applications. Number one opportunity we're given the bad guys. So we did a study of our kind of protected user base, or a subsection of our protected user base in 2013. 31 million vulnerable programs. On the average, there was eight to a user's computer. So can't stress enough got to stay as patched as possible. And on that patching thing, I'm a big, I'm a big Brian Krebs fan. Just finished his book on the plane flight out here. If you didn't go look, looking for it, don't install it. If you installed it, update it. And if you no longer need it, get it the heck off uh, the device. It's, it's only causing risk for you. All right, now are five ways IT may be an accomplice. And again, here are just some things to think about of what maybe you're doing, not doing that could be putting you more at risk. Migration myopia, believing that home data never, I'm sorry, that the data never gets to home systems and back into your environments, potentially compromised. And I will confess on that a couple of occasions. I've been in my home office, but I, I remember one time I was going to be doing a version of this presentation to a local uh, ISC Square chapter. And to get away from the distractions of my email and stuff, I put the presentation on a USB. I went upstairs to one of our family desktop computers, rehearsed it, ended up moving a couple slides around, saved it, and brought it back. And later in the day, I realized I had violated my, uh, my rule number one here. Number two, social media without protection. So here I obviously told you my story and told you that I'm a, I'm a big Facebook guy. And it's certainly not going to go away, but are you... Do you block access? Do you possibly limit, you know, limit access to the people that don't need it to just uh, lunchtime? Do you have any acceptable use policies that IT that people are signing, saying maybe at a minimum it's guidelines of what they can say or not say about their involvement with your organization on their social networking sites? Number three, this is probably my favorite: attention misdirection. So focusing on prevention versus detection and response. So the gentleman did this study a couple years back, Dave Stezel. He does a lot of security research and writing in the industry. And he came in to speak at one of our internal meetings once. So he'd done this survey and he was trying to get a sense of how IT folks felt about protecting their homes and the, you know, their families and their possessions versus how they felt about protecting their data. So you can see vast majority of folks listed one of these things on the bottom as a way to kind of protect their homes. And then he asked them a big picture 
you know, on this prevention, detection, response, and the same amount of folks thought in general prevention, you know, got to keep the burglar out of the house. And he thought that that kind of went along with general IT security spending, that you prevent it, you got to keep it out, which you certainly do. So I'm by no means saying we don't need firewalls and things, uh, things like that. But he asked us, and I thought, okay, about my house, would I be better just in a prevention thing if I had some extra money to put up a big fence or an extra set of locks on the doors? Or would I be better in a detection response scenario of, you know, the alarm system that triggers the call to the police? I thought, never really thought about it before that, but I thought definitely the detector respond. And as he asked us, and I was asking all of you to think about your environments, is do you have the proper balance of the, you know, the needed preventative keep it out stuff versus the needed detect and respond stuff uh, to find the stuff that's in there? So, I remember seeing a talk from a Cisco security specialist at an event a couple years ago. She said during her talk, in her mind, there were only two types of organizations. The ones that have been hacked and know it, and the ones that have been hacked and don't know it. Awareness deficit. Failing to foster a culture of awareness. You know, the message here would be, if you only had a dollar to spend, spend it on IT security. In the spirit of time, I have a couple of other stories that I would normally tell that I've heard, but you know, you, you just think that uh, RSA HR employee. Sure, good, smart, hardworking person, made a big mistake, could have been the most locked down environment, clicked on something she shouldn't have, and was in harm's way. And then the last one, reliance on compliance. Interesting statement by this gentleman, just one step north of negligence. And the, you know, the, the thinking here would be, again, probably saying some, a couple of obvious things, would be that if you're in a, a various industry that has some, some uh, certification where you need your check mark to be compliant, it certainly doesn't mean you're, you're safe and secure. I mean, you know, Target was PCI compliant. And a not IT related real story, when the Titanic set sail all those years ago, was actually over compliant on lifeboat capacity as required by the government of England. Unfortunately, you know, well oversubscribed on passengers. And those laws were quickly changed. And, you know, I still think you see that today, that sort of eternal you know, chasing of the tail, living, living and learning. And then this is what we do. I mean, most people that know Kaspersky kind of think as we got our start in the U.S. on the retail side, but just a quick representation of our network-based product. And if anybody would like to know a little bit more about it, we've got a table in there. We'll be hanging out through lunch for the rest of the day. But we do a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff other than just the AV detection that people uh, know us about. Mobile security, MDM capabilities, encryption, systems management, so in their land desk like uh, vulnerability scanning, patch management, and some other features, and everything engineered internally at the company, so we can do all that from a single management console. Our visionary guys thought that, that there was a real need in the market for a vendor to bring you know, one platform forward that could potentially allow somebody to consolidate a few things. And then my final slide, I often will get asked, uh, you know, hey Mark, why is your widget better than the next guy's? And there are a lot of things, but for me it's uh, detection rates. And what this chart, it's a, it's a summary of all of the independent testing done of AV vendors and their products uh, around the world in 2014. And we've always done well on the tests. So a couple years ago, we started summarizing like this. So we have a guy that goes through all of the tests and he simply counts up the number of tests that each vendor participated in and the number of first, second, and third place finishes you know, on catch rate in those tests and plot it and plots it. So if you got a big circle you know, up, up there, in the top corner, that would simply mean a lot of tests, a lot of first, second, third places, and you know, smaller circles down here, by no means slamming any of the vendors, just representing you know, fewer tests, fewer first, second, and third place finishes. So you know, I may be biased because I get a paycheck from the company, the spirit of full disclosure, but I think it's a very powerful slide for us to you know, why we're as good at uh, what we do. But enough of that. Um, I'm done. I hope you've enjoyed this. I've given a few things to, maybe a few new things to uh, think about, or when you come to a conference like this, maybe bubbled up a couple things. You're like, oh yeah. I said, happy to share the slides, and I'll, don't want to keep it here from lunch, but I'll be in there if anyone would like to stop by and talk a little bit more about this or about Kaspersky. But appreciate it, and I hope you got something from it. Thank you very much.